Chapter Seven of Conan Beyond the Black River by Robert E. Howard. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Seven The Devil in the Fire. When Conan turned from the Velitrium Road, he expected a run of some nine miles and set himself to the task. But he had not gone four when he heard the sounds of a party of men ahead of him. From the noise they were making in their progress, he knew they were not picks. He hailed them. "'Who's there?' challenged a harsh voice. "'Stand where you are until we know you, or you'll get an arrow through you.' "'You couldn't hit an elephant in this darkness,' answered Conan impatiently. "'Come on, fool. It's I, Conan. The picks are over the river.' "'We suspected as much.' answered the leader of the men, as they strode forward, tall, rangy men, stern-faced, with bows in their hands. One of our party wounded an antelope and tracked it nearly to Black River. He heard them yelling down the river and ran back to our camp. We left the salt in the wagons, turned the oxen loose, and came as swiftly as we could. If the picks are besieging the fort, war parties will be ranging up the road toward our cabins. "'Your families are safe,' grunted Conan. My companion went ahead to take them to Velitrium. If we go back to the main road, we may run into the whole horde. We'll strike southeast through the timber. Go ahead, I'll scout behind. A few moments later, the whole band was hurrying southeastward. Conan followed more slowly, keeping just within earshot. He cursed the noise they were making. That many Picts or Cimmerians would have moved through the woods with no more noise than the wind makes as it blows through the black branches. He had just crossed a small glade when he wheeled, answering the conviction of his primitive instincts that he was being followed. Standing motionless among the bushes, he heard the sounds of the retreating settlers fade away. Then a voice called faintly back along the way he had come, Conan! Conan! Wait for me! Conan! Balthus! he swore bewilderedly. Cautiously he called, Here I am. Wait for me, Conan! The voice came more distinctly. Conan moved out of the shadows, scowling. What the devil are you doing here? Crom! He half crouched, the flesh prickling along his spine. It was not Balthus who was emerging from the other side of the glade. A weird glow burned through the trees. It moved toward him, shimmering weirdly, a green witch-fire that moved with purpose and intent. It halted some feet away, and Conan glared at it, trying to distinguish its fire-misted outlines. The quivering flame had a solid core, the flame was but a green garment that masked some animate and evil entity, but the Cimmerian was unable to make out its shape or likeness. Then, shockingly, a voice spoke to him from amidst the fiery column. "'Why do you stand like a sheep waiting for the butcher, Conan?' The voice was human, but carried strange vibrations that were not human. "'Sheep?' Conan's wrath got the best of his momentary awe. Do you think I'm afraid of a damned Pictish swamp devil? A friend called me. I called in his voice, answered the other. The men you follow belong to my brother. I would not rob his knife of their blood. But you are mine. Oh, fool! You have come from the far gray hills of Cimmeria to meet your doom in the forest of Konajahara. "'You've had your chance at me before now,' snorted Conan. "'Why didn't you kill me then, if you could?' "'My brother had not painted a skull black for you, and hurled it into the fire that burns forever on Gula's black altar. He had not whispered your name to the black ghosts that haunt the uplands of the Darkland. But a bat has flown over the mountains of the dead, and drawn your image in blood on the white tiger's hide that hangs before the long hut where sleeps the four brothers of the night. The great serpents coil about their feet, 
and the stars burn like fireflies in their hair. Why have the gods of darkness doomed me to death? growled Conan. Something, a hand, foot, or talon, he could not tell which, thrust out from the fire and marked swiftly on the mold. A symbol blazed there, marked with fire, and faded, but not before he recognized it. You dared make the sign which only a priest of Jabal Sag dare make. Thunder rumbled through the black mountain of the dead, and the altar hut of Gula was thrown down by a wind from the gulf of ghosts. The loon, which is messenger to the four brothers of the night, flew swiftly and whispered your name in my ear. Your head will hang in the altar hut of my brother. Your body will be eaten by the black-winged, sharp-beaked children of Jehil. Who the devil is your brother? demanded Conan. His sword was naked in his hand, and he was subtly loosening the axe in his belt. Zogar Sarg, a child of Jabal Sarg, who still visits his sacred groves at times. A woman of Gwawila slept in a grove holy to Jabal Sag. Her babe was Zogar Sag. I, too, am a son of Jabal Sag, out of a fire being from a far realm. Zogar Sag summoned me out of the misty lands. With incantations and sorcery and his own blood, he materialized me in the flesh of his own planet. We are one, tied together by invisible threads. His thoughts are my thoughts. If he is struck, I am bruised. If I am cut, he bleeds. But I have talked enough. Soon... Your ghosts will talk with the ghosts of the Dark Land, and they will tell you of the old gods which are not dead, but sleep in the outer abysses, and, from time to time, awake. I'd like to see what you look like, muttered Conan, working his axe free. You who leave a track like a bird, who burn like a flame, and yet speak with a human voice. You shall see, answered the voice from the flame. See, and carry the knowledge with you into the dark land. The flames leaped and sank, dwindling and dimming. A face began to take shadowy form. At first Conan thought it was Zogar Sog himself, who stood wrapped in green fire. But the face was higher than his own, and there was a demoniac aspect about it. Conan had noted various abnormalities about Zogar Sog's features, an obliqueness of the eyes, a sharpness of the ears, a wolfish thinness of the lips. These peculiarities were exaggerated in the apparition which swayed before him. The eyes were red as coals of living fire. More details came into view. A slender torso, covered with snaky scales, which was yet manlike in shape, with manlike arms from the waist upward. Below, long, crane-like legs ended in splay three-toed feet like those of some huge bird. Along the monstrous limbs the blue fire fluttered and ran. He saw it as through a glistening mist. Then suddenly it was towering over him, though he had not seen it move toward him. A long arm, which for the first time he noticed was armed with curbing, sickle-like talons, swung high and swept down at his neck. With a fierce cry he broke the spell and bounded aside, hurling his axe. The demon avoided the cast with an unbelievably quick movement of its narrow head and was on him again with a hissing rush of leaping flames. But fear had fought for it when it slew his other victims and Conan was not afraid. He knew that any being clothed in material flesh can be slain by material weapons, however grisly its form may be. 
One flailing talon-armed limb knocked his helmet from his head. A little lower, and it would have decapitated him. But fierce joy surged through him as his savagely driven sword sank deep in the monster's groin. He bounded backward from a flailing stroke, tearing his sword free as he leaped. The talons raked his breast, ripping through male links as if they had been cloth. But his return spring was like that of a starving wolf. He was inside the lashing arms, and driving his sword deep in the monster's belly, felt the arms lock about him, and the talons ripping the mail from his back as they sought his vitals. He was lapped and dazzled by the blue flame that was chill as ice. Then he had torn fiercely away from the weakening arms, and his sword cut the air in a tremendous swipe. The demon staggered and fell, sprawling sidewise, its head hanging only by a shred of flesh. The fires that veiled it leaped fiercely upward, now red as gushing blood, hiding the figure from view. A scent of burning flesh filled Conan's nostrils. Shaking the blood and sweat from his eyes, he wheeled and ran, staggering through the woods. Blood trickled from his limbs. Somewhere, miles to the south, he saw the faint glow of flames that might mark a burning cabin. Behind him, toward the road, rose a distant howling that spurred him to greater efforts. End of chapter 7